I'll just go ahead and get started without David. I was kind of planning on doing that anyway. Um, so, first of all, thank you guys and thank all of y'all watching behind the camera for checking out our bi weekly seminars. We do these every two weeks at Lake Fork Marina. Some variances in that schedule, but for the most part, it's every two weeks. Our next one will be two weeks from tonight. If you want to come back to another one, we sure appreciate it. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go along, whenever you want, especially at the end. We always open it up. We want, we want you guys to ask questions, so thank you some as we're sitting here. But tonight, what I figured I'd talk to you guys about is there's, you know, when you show up to a lake, and I think there's a lot of people that come to Lake Fork from now until spawn time, there's people that are showing up to Lake Fork that aren't familiar with the lake, right? And they're out-of-towners, first-timers, you know, it's a destination lake. It's one of those lakes across the country that people travel to. So, when you get to a lake you're not familiar with, what's the first thing you got to do? You got to figure out where to fish, Right? Like, where, what do I need to look for on my Navionics map? What section of the... I get asked all the time, is the East Fork or the West Fork? But like, well, that ain't really how it works. But it's a pattern. It's not really one side of the lake or the other going off. But, you know, so I think there's a lot of misconceptions about that. And, and what I thought we would do tonight, with it being a kind of a little bit of a transitional time, some fish with the warming trends we've had lately are pulling shallow. Some fish are still out. Some fish are in between. So there's really, to me, about four different types of structure that you need to focus on between now and when they start spawning. So this is in effect as of here the last few weeks. It's been in effect and it will stay in effect until we get, you know, a predominant amount of fish on beds towards usually around March 20, 20, 20th is about when we get like a big percentage of the fish are spawning in Lake Fork. So I figured we would kind of go over those structures and some ways to fish them tonight. And like I said, if you guys have questions, just fire away. So some of this stuff you've probably heard if you watch the content we make. You've probably heard me talk about it lately. Uh, two of these gentlemen on either side of Mr. Snow right there were with me this morning. So y'all got to see some of this structure because we fished it this morning. Uh, but, you know, creek channels are a big deal. We talk about creek channels a lot this winter, so we won't beat that over the head too much tonight. But you guys know creek channels are where the old creeks flow before the lake dried up. And, and those fish really use that as... Uh, they use it as I know everybody's always said they use it as highways, and I do think those fish use it as highways. But like you see, you tell me a fish that's so dumb that he eats plastic and metal every day is not going to just wander out of the creek channel and swim up the bank. Like, I mean, if the sun's out, he's probably going to go swim up that bank. I think what creek channels are are great stop signs with their de sudden depth changes. You know, they're, they're little drop offs that they have going into them, and I think that's why the best ones seem to be the creeks that are not silted in that have the sharpest breaks. Those really seem to be be the best creek channels to catch fish in. And so I think what you've got is this fish are traveling in and out. You find a good creek bend, it's got a good drop off, got some big tree root systems hanging over them. I think you've got a really good stop sign right there. And I think that's why they're so good. And even some of the creek channel stretches that are straighter will have some of those features of those trees being along them and having those roots hang over. And I really feel like that's why those fish are there. Not so much that they're not just sucking down to the bottom of the channel and moving up and down the creek. I mean, maybe they do, maybe they don't, who knows. But what I do know is they, they gather up on those and kind of stage on them and hang out on them while they're traveling. They may stop there and feed a little bit or sit there. Sometimes they just sit there at the mouth of a pocket, right, and they just wait. It was We had a really cool one today. One of the fish, uh, uh, Mr. Steve back here, caught a seven-pounder this morning. And what was really cool about that fish is that fish was sitting, the creek channel came in there and made a, a big swing to the right. They came over and it makes a big swing to the left. Right where it makes that swing to the left, you can literally look at this line of bigger oak trees that runs down the secondary creek or a drain like we like to call it. You can look at this line of oak trees, this drain that runs right back into the back of that pocket that's right there. And so as that creek swung over by that point in the middle of that creek arm and made that turn, that drain fed off, that fish was sitting right beside that junction. Now that fish right there has made her way to there. And she was pale white, so she's probably pretty new. But she's going to sit right there. And I tell them, that fish is going to stay right there. Probably on that same tree, but right in this little, about the size of this room area, that fish will be right there, and then when it warms up, she'll slide up that drain and maybe get on the bank for a day or two while it's warm, and then slide back into that drain and move out. And then when it's time to spawn, when it's finally, that moon cycle gets right, it's warm enough, she's going to slide down that drain, and when the moon cycle's right, she'll get up on that bank and do her thing for a couple days, and she'll come right back in that drain and make her way right back to here. And so for the next two, three months, the place to catch that seven pounder is right around there. Most days, other than, you know, warming trends, she'll push up, you know. But most days, the place to catch that seven pounder is going to be right there. Now, that's a really predictable piece of structure, right, guys? Like, that's, you know, if you can start finding a few of those stretches that are holding some good fish, 
you can kind of see how that can be really productive for several months for you. And as long as you're not on a major warming trend, those fish are going to be there every day. Now, it's cold, so getting on the bite's not always the easiest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. You can be around all the fish in the world and not get them to bite on this lake, especially in and this time of year on any lake that can happen to you. In fact, we had another tree that we pulled up on today, and I was like, you know, guys, this is one of those trees. Like, this is one of those trees. <laughs> we catch them off that tree. Your money stump. It's well, it wasn't the guarantee. It's not the guarantee tree, but <laughs> it was a. Uh, it was one. Of, it's one of those trees that I've caught a lot of fish off. You're of. getting so many stumps and trees named out here. I don't know how you're gonna keep track of them all. I don't even have a name for this one other. I mean, it's he, a huge. He don't know. He don't no, know. I don't. I'm not real big on official names and all that stuff. The guarantee. It's just gotta happen. That's like nicknames, right? Like you can't make it up. You can't force it. If it gets a tree's good enough to get a name, it's gonna get the name. Like the guarantee tree just happened. Imagine, organically. You imagine might say. a dollar for every video I ever watched where you said that's a money stump by Big yeah. Ridge. And there's there's a lot of them out here that are. And this was one of them. We pulled up on it and we made five or six casts on either side of this stump and nothing. And then after that stump, I was leaving that stretch of channel. And so I just kind of trolled past that stump. And when I did on our 2D sonar, you said I was showing them. I was like, look how that thing comes up right there. That's why they sit right there on that drop off, you know, da 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 da. And then there's a daggum fish arc sitting right above that root ball. And it's about a foot tall. So, you know, if you look on 2D sonar, you can't really tell much about the width. If they go under your deal real fast, it'll be real short and squatty. But if they stay under your sonar on your trolling motor, it could be real long. But the height is always the same. That's how you judge them on 2D sonar on your trolling motor. And so it was the, the height of that fish was clear as day, was a foot tall. I mean, it was lined up perfectly with the depth markings, a foot tall. So if you got a fish that's 12 inches belly to back, <laughs> That's somewhere between a short and squatty six or seven pounder and a 10, 12, who knows? <laughs> like it's a giant, it's a big one. So, But that fish was sitting right there and we just thrown a jig at her four or five times at least. I mean, put it right in her grill and she just didn't bite. So that's part of what you battle in the winter time with those staging fishes. They can, when they're staging in those creek channels, sit there and get the shut mouth and just not bite nothing, you know? So it, it's tough. You just gotta stay in the right areas and keep fishing and grind out and understand on a good day, you fish eight hours, you're probably going to catch six to eight fish. I mean, that, but they'll be big. I mean, they, we catch any small ones? We get any small bites today? No. Not one. <laughs> you just don't get very many small bites doing that. So, so that's the first structure and the one that I feel like is the easiest. It's probably the easiest to locate as far as you can kind of, especially when the stumps are out of the water, you can really see the bigger stumps and really kind of get real precise with how you target those fish. So that's probably the easiest one to fish. Now, uh, the other one, the second structure that we're going to talk about that kind of relates to that. Yes, sir. To go back to your last seminar, um, you were talking about casting two to four feet to the sides mm -hmm. of those root systems and everything. Okay, just make sure I remember. Yeah, because the deal, you know, like if you get right up against the tree trunk, there's going to be knobs on that tree or per perhaps a little bit of an old branch that used to be there that can hang your line up and then pull your jig way up out of the roots, and that causes a problem. And these big, bigger oak trees that we're sitting on, you know, their root systems are, you know, sometimes six, eight foot wide. So there's no reason to, you don't have to be right next to the tree to yeah. feel the roots. And I've, always the tried, I've always tried <laughs> to hit the tree. <laughs> yeah, no, you don't really need to do that. I mean, if you're fishing really shallow and you're just pitching and falling down the trunk, that's fine. But the way we're doing it, we're actually pitching past it, dragging up to it. Uh, that's how I like to do it. And there's times when we get a little shallower and we'll just pitch to the... You know, I told them today, we got back a little further back and got shallow. I said, man, just, just pitch the timber, guys. Just throw at it like you'd throw at it any other time when you're bed fishing. or Just throw that jig upside that tree, hop it around a couple times, and go to the next one. What creek was that again? I'll tell you right just where it was. No, I'll tell you exactly where it was. It was in the water. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I asked a guy one time what they were catching them on. The guy said, it looks. I was like, yeah. I'm never asking Are they a guy. Are you never catch asking a guy to know Yeah, they ask you, you ask you where are you catching them, you tell them right in the mouth. Right, right, right in the mouth. mouth. That's right. In the lake. <laughs> Gentlemen, we have some more chairs downstairs if y'all like to get, get a chair. We'll, we'll make we'll David for us. Dad, tell you, yeah. Well, he'll, be, that, he'll be here just a minute. If y'all with old Big man. Money Dave, he can afford to bring the chairs. Yeah, that's he, Big he, Money Dave right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the second structure that kind of relates to those creek channels that's real important out here, it's really important for the warming trends. But once we've had a warming trend or two, which we've had two, 
We've had a two day and a three day warming trend, and that last three day was a whopper. I mean, it was, it made the water temps really climb. I found water temps as high as 62 degrees. The structure that's going to be important for that is going to be. Finally here. Finally hey, hey, here, you can start. Hey, hey. Yeah. We started without you. Man. Some of us How you work, doing, brother? Some of us work Good for a living. <laughs> that's overrated. That sucks. <laughs> some of us actually work. So. <laughs> The other key structure that's close to those creek channels is going to be the shallowest water you can find. So I want to try to explain some of that to y'all because I feel like there's a lot of guys that miss this deal. Like they they try to do it, they go fish shallow, and they just don't get in the right areas. So the key to what you've got to find, and these two gentlemen got to see a real good example of one this morning where I was able to show them. We idled as we were leaving. We fished way back into a creek staying on the channel because it's cold. But uh, as we eased out of there, we got out of the creek, and I said, okay, you see this? We're out in the middle of this creek arm. The channel's right over there. It's five or six foot deep. This is two foot deep from here to that bank. And that bank's way over there. I said, and it's that shallow or shallower all the way as far as you can see that way. The deal is you've got to find the most massive expanse of shallow water that you can find. So wherever the, on your Navionic, wherever the flattest stuff is, you know, the flattest bays, the flattest creek arms, you don't want the steeper sloping stuff. The reason that is, is volume of water. The less volume of water that's in a big area, the more it's going to warm up. So the more, you know, if you've got a, a pitcher of iced tea that's got ice cubes in it top to bottom, that's going to take a lot longer for that ice to melt than a solo cup with ice in it. Right? right. So that is going to take a lot more time to warm up those deeper volumes of water that have more depth to them. So you want the shallow water to be as expansive as possible. That's going to allow the back of that creek to warm up that much more and it can be a very significant difference and last week it was a huge difference if you got i mean i was pushing so far back in the creeks i got stuck like three times last <laughs> week I, and i know and I, and I know the lake like i know where the low spots are in these creeks and you get a little bit off of them and you're stuck and i've still got another five hundred thousand yards to go to get to where i want to fish <laughs> to where it gets you know i just got that little pool of water that's just going to be 62 degrees is what it was last week you know so uh, now those areas are going to be super important for warm trends but not just for warm trends but once you've had a warm trend they can clue you in to exactly where fish will be positioned because once you find those areas that get that significantly warmer water those fish pull into it on a warm trend and they don't leave the entire area, guys. They just don't. I've caught fish all week this week. We've been extremely cold trending this week. In fact, that water that was 62 last Wednesday, Thursday is now 46. <laughs> 46 is what it is. So as much as it swings up in temperature in that shallow water, it also cools faster in that shallow. What freezes faster, a solo cup of water or a pitcher? <laughs> and you put it in the freezer. Yeah, okay, right. So the less volume water is also going to cool off faster. But don't get disheartened by that about fishing shallow. Once you've had warm trends, they aren't going to be all the way back in the dirt anymore. You don't need to waste your time pushing way back in there. But what you need to do is find the drain or the channel that leads to it. Get as far back in there as you can and then start fishing your way back out until you get a bite or two. And that's where you're going to start targeting fish at. Because all they do is suck back to the middle. And the more days it's colder, they just slowly pull out down that that bottom whatever channel or drain you got in there they'll slowly start backing out and they may end up a little bit of ways away from that stuff but they're not going way 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 away from it back to the main lake they're going to be pretty close like i said we did our first bite we got this morning the creek channel was five or six foot deep but the flat was two foot deep on either side of the creek channel so that fish even though he may have been sitting on the drop of that creek where he was sitting was only two foot deep right on the top side of that creek channel so that's a really important thing to be able to find. Number one is the creek channels. And then number two is those shallowest flats that are going to warm the earliest. Those are going to be where the fish pull up on warming trends. Those are going to be where the fish spawn earliest. And to me, in my mind, that is where the fish are the furthest along and the easiest to catch. They're the most aggressive fish in the lake. The fish that are pulling up, getting that warmer water are going to get more active. They're closer to spawning than the other fish. So they're feeding the females to me, in my mind, are probably feeding even more. So that's really important to find that. So that's two structures that you got to find right now, and then there's two more. <laughs> David, what you got? <laughs> well, wait, you I have a question. Up. How does a recent rain affect that? And we already discussed that before you got here. You discussed that before you got here. 
<laughs> what, 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 do you, what do you think the 60 degree uh, warm rain is going to do this weekend? So what I think rain does to it is absolutely insignificant. I think that the only two things that matter about rain are the temperature changes that it creates and the water color change that it creates. Now the water color change in the back of some of these shallow areas yeah. can play a role, but only for a few days. But what does that mean? All right, let it means me you need more vibration. Mm. Hybrid hunter, uh, chartreuse with a black bag. I'll tell you this. I don't. It could mean that if you're still, if it's warm trending and it gets muddy, then yes, you need more vibration because they're going to be on the shallow flats. You want to vibrate. In that case, even when the water's clear, I'm throwing a crankbait that wobbles so hard your arms numb at the end of the day, <laughs> and a chatterbait that does a chatterbait thing you know i'm throwing a jackhammer chatterbait so i'm throwing vibrating baits in that shallow water when they get up there anyway because here's the deal guys even though it's warm trending it's still 62 degrees if you were butt naked in a room that was 62 degrees you'd still be cold when you live in it 24 7 right so those fish are still colder than they want to be so i need something that will cause a fish to react they even though they're pulling up there and getting more active it's not just like may where they're chasing everything down from across the other side of the creek to eat it reactions right you still got to make them react so everything that i throw in that shallow water for the most part is vibrating baits um the rain though to get back to david's question on the rain if the rain blows it out muddy which some of the creeks it did tuesday it rained all day and it never rained like super super hard but it rained all day and enough water came in that the back of some of the major creeks did get blowed out muddy to me, that makes, like, the day that that happens, the day after that happens, like, when it's coming in still and it's just now, it went from being this clarity to this clarity, that's just get out of there. Like, don't even fish it, leave. Once that's had two or three days to settle and those fish have had two or three days to get used to that water clarity, get after it. Fish will eat just fine in dirty water, and you don't have to get real elaborate on changing your bait colors or any of that stuff. We had this discussion today, too. Yeah. What color is a bluegill, guys? In it around here, a brim brown, gold brown, give, give red, or take, it's brown. Got some red, <laughs> yeah. Give or take, the general hue of a brim around here is brown, right? What color is that water when it gets muddy? You think them bass don't need a bluegill in muddy water? Well, that was if they like, can find, I like muddy water. That was going to be my question. I can kill them in muddy water. If they can those, find a brim in that water, they can find whatever bait you want to throw but those at Those fish them. aren't going to leave just because that flow of that creek they're not going to leave pours in they're not going to leave i feel like it shocks them for a day or two and they need a little bit of time to acclimate because it does seem like that first day or two they don't bite as good but if you're going to change i mean to match that if you know that you're in an area where there's a lot of big fish and which he's obviously knows where some of these areas are i then, hope so yeah change <laughs> I, I don't know last year we were i wrote it rotated over to a uh, literally a white three quarter ounce or even a white one ounce spinner bait, and, and I'm telling you what, we hammer time them things in February. Yeah, vib vibration is always good, and I mean, and, you know, I just maybe I just oversimplify things at times, or I just don't think things through at times as much. But man, I'll throw that same white big bladed spinner bait that yeah. vibrates its head, I'll throw that when the water's clean. Yeah, yeah. I oh, just yeah. everything I throw we in the wintertime, I'll water to vibrate. Well, I was throwing willow blades, but we weren't catching a ton of fish. But the ones that did latch onto it, they were gorillas. So, <laughs> and we'll get more into how we fish these areas. But we got there's two more types of structure, okay, that you need to be aware of from now till major spawn time. Um, now, those two that we just talked about, you're going to find those in the back halves of the creeks, right? Th those aren't really for the main lake, okay? These next two, these are main lake. And with these four structures, one thing about Lake Fork, it's a very diverse fishery, very diverse fishery. So there's always fish main lake, there's always fish shallow to some degree or another. When there's grass, there's more fish shallow year round, but there's always some of everything going on on this lake. But with these four structures right here, you can cover from main lake to the back of the creek. And over this time period that we're talking about, that's all you need is these four structures to do fish however you want to fish. So the other two structures, Number one is going to be uh, main lake and secondary that are out towards the mouth of the creek points. Okay. And this time of year, I feel like the ones that have timber are much better than the ones that don't. There's plenty of points on this lake. 
most of them do have timber, but there's some that don't. Y'all, if you fish the lake, you know what I'm talking about. There's down there towards the dam, mouth of the little canyon, all there, there's a bunch of those points down there that just don't have any timber on them. And what I'm talking about is fishing these main lake points in anywhere from six to eight out to 15 to 17, sometimes even as deep as 20, but not very often. That 20 deal is an outlier this time of year. Really, it's about six or eight down to about 15 foot of water, depending on the trend. With the cool trends, you tend to go deeper. With warm trends, you tend to go shallower on these points. And, and the thing you got to be aware of and cognizant of is you do not, you do not need to fish the bottom on these points this time of year. This is not the place to throw your jig or your shaky head or your Carolina rig. This is the place to throw two baits, maybe three, a jerk bait, an Alabama rig, and if you want to, a real big swim bait. But if you want to take the chance on, you know, looking for one up. bite, then the big swim bait plays on these main lake and secondary points out towards the mouth of the creeks close to the main lake. And, and the deal on this is, you know, with live sonar, it's changed that game. It's made those fish harder to catch. There's no doubt about it. Those fish, is, it's not that they're harder to catch. They are way more efficiently targeted than they've ever been. Like before, we would kind of, well, there's some wind blowing on that point, and we'd drift around that point and twitch our jerk bait and our Alabama rig. And if we got bit, great. And if we did, we move on to the next one. Now there's guys going up looking with live sonar and putting a bait right on their head every time they throw it, right? And if there's not fish on that point, they don't even fish, and they save time and move on. So a much bigger number of these fish are being targeted precisely with the invention of live sonar. Um, so those fish, you got to be on your game to catch those fish a little bit. And those fish day-to-day -day will move on you. But I got to tell you guys, you'll catch smaller fish doing that sometimes, but the very biggest fish, the very biggest fish in this lake will show up on that pattern this time of year. You know, when we had the Bass Pro Tour here last February, we saw some guys throwing a jig and catching some big ones. You know what we didn't see? For whatever it's worth, we did not see a 10-pounder get caught on a jig in that tournament. They caught five double-digit fish. You know what every one of them was caught on? Jig. A jerk bait. A jerk bait. Live sonar jerk baiting. Every 10 pounder that was caught in the Bass Pro Tour, it was caught on a live sonar and a jerk bait. Suspended. Suspended in timber. And that's what these fish, this is why I tell you, you don't need to fish the bottom. You can fish the, the depth of the water column from six to eight foot down to about 15 foot, but those fish aren't on the bottom on that deal. They're pulling up suspended in those trees wherever the temperature is telling them to get depth wise. And that's why you, you know, if you're going to pursue that pattern these days, I really feel like. You need to be using live sonar. And if you don't have it, I understand. You don't have it. If you don't have it, you just got to understand you're at a huge disadvantage to catch that pattern of fish on Lake Fork in the pre-spawn. The last structure that you really need to key in on, and this is one that gets extremely popular in the springtime, but is very underutilized right now. And these fish will pull up on this stuff at times right now, even when it's cold. The shallow points. The shallow shell beds. We've actually got a video coming out this week where I break it down in depth and we go walk around on what is dry land right now that is shallow points that we've always fished to really give you guys an up close look at what it is that we're fishing on those and break all that down. That video is coming up, so watch for that. So if you want to know every detail about how to fish shallow points, it's coming here real soon on our channel. But, uh, man, I, I can't tell you guys, you know, I'll be honest with you, that shallow point deal here takes fire out of me in the springtime. So many people fish it now. It's so popular. And we all saw... It's the ultimate home run pattern, guys. The Lee Livesey deal in April, two years, three years ago, whatever it was, when he caught 42 pounds, mm -hmm. that's it. In the same spot. Yeah, on one, on one of those shallow points. And that's the <laughs> thing about that pattern is it's become a deal now. On Lake, back in the day, not very many people fished it. And the guys that fished it could go out and know they were going to catch 30 pounds every day back then. Now that that's become the popular pattern, you can run those points all day and not get bit until you pull up on the right one at the right time. But, man, when it's the right one at the right time, it can be really, really, really special. So it's ultimate home run pattern, and nobody except a couple guys utilizes it in January and February. And when you start seeing them loons, and they're here now, they're, you'll see them up on that stuff. And if they're up on that stuff, guess what else is up on that stuff? Them big old bass. Are. <laughs> so that is a pattern that you can run, and it is a little more gamble, hit, or miss deal. If, if you notice something here, the main lake stuff is a little more hit or miss, right? Mm -hmm. And it is. But I'll tell you, the, the way to fish that right now is, number one, fish the one the wind's blowing on. Right into it's the best. Crosswind's okay. If it blows away from or off that point, don't even bother with that one. You need the wind blowing on it. 
But a Carolina rig, full-size brush hog, is probably the best bait to throw on there in the cold time of year. Other than that, again, a jerk bait's really, really good. And don't worry about that jerk bait banging that clay or that rock. It works just fine like that. They eat it great like that. Um, and then again, a big swim bait. A big swim bait can always do some damage. Now, that usually works better when we get warmer on the shallow points. Um, but it can work right now as well. So that's the four structures. We got creek channels. We got extremely shallow flats relating to the creek channels for the warm trends. And then we've got main lake points in six to 15 foot of water with suspended fish. And we've got shallow points that they're pulling up on actively feeding at times. And we're fishing in one to two to three foot of water typically on those. Uh, those are the four structures. Now, how to fish them Man, you know, we kind of talked about, we touched a little bit on some of all of it. Um, you, I don't want to get into one more thing before we move on to how to fish them. The, the hit or miss deal on the main lake. Does anybody, anybody have any idea why that is? They roll. Anybody have any thoughts on why the main lake stuff is? More fish are up shallow. That's part of it. The whole population is not out there. But because I, uh, a high, there is a good percentage population that's already moved in. That's a good point. But there's to me, there's something else that is just really, really simple. See, I think we overthink way, way too much of fish. There's something that's really simple about that that makes it hit or miss. They're not going to spawn on the main lake. They yeah, spawn the, up in the, their pockets. Yeah, no, the that's true. The bass is on the fork just like it a little shallower. Well, like to be but, on the shallower. But, <coughs> yeah, but, that's but you're just referring to main lake. I'm, I'm yeah, to that's that. what I'm talking so about. What, main but what lake, I'm saying is there, there's fish that aren't going to spawn until May out here. That aren't moving into that creek arm until April. So, Oxygen why is that fish more hit or miss? Why is he not consistently on the same thing, but the fish that are in the back of the creek are on the same thing every day? Mate. It's really simple. We're all overthinking. Options. It's just options. If you get back into a creek where outside the creek it's two to six foot of water, of mud flat till you get to the bank, and it's a creek channel out there, what's his options to get on? The bank or the channel. That's it. That's all he's got. If you're down here on the main lake on a point in 10 foot of water, you've got, first of all, 30 other points right next to you on either side. <laughs> you've got God knows how much timber out there, right? It's literally that simple. That is more hit or miss because those fish have a lot more options readily accessible to them. So it becomes a little bit more of the needle in the haystack situation trying to locate those fish. That's all there is to it. It's just more options for us. Lots of bait. There's lots of bait everywhere in this lake. That's one thing that I learned. I had another guide tell me this one time when I first started guiding, I, I found my sonar just lit up with bait balls, man. I mean, lit up with bait balls, right? And, and I was so excited. It was a fall, you know, find the bait, find the bass. And I found these walls of bait in the fall. And I took pictures of all this and sent it to him. He's like, dude, look what I found today. You know, I got guide trips coming up. Look what I found today. It's my first year guiding. He's like, He's like that's awesome, dude. You found bait. Anybody find bait on this lake? Where the bass at? Yeah. And that's how this lake is. There's bait everywhere. There's yep. bait everywhere. So, um, what you been doing? You, I haven't seen you right here. You've been over on the heated I've been the heated deal? taking people over to the heated world. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Going ain't nothing wrong with hey, it's, go, the numbers. it's going down over there, man. It, no, well, it ain't just numbers well, over there this time of year. Well, I got news for you, my man. Uh, we, we had a poor day today over there, and I was uh -oh. a bit shocked. Martin Creek? I was a uh, Welch. I was a Welch. bit on the shock side that it was uh, it was uh, some yeah. tough sledding. So, uh, well, I had but some... that happens over there two percent of the time. Right, right, right. Very, very, very seldom that that does actually happen on that pond. And we tried a bunch of different things, a bunch of different patterns, and um, I, I was I was mildly a little dismayed with it as far as that goes. I had somebody ask me the other day on a live stream. They asked me how do these hard cold fronts affect the power plant lake fish, the heated water lake fish, and I said, man, there's some like. There's a little bit where it doesn't affect them as much, but guys, it affects them like that high pressure and that set, you know, that water temperature is cooling as well. And the trend always matters more than the temperature to me. And when it starts cool trending there and they got high pressure, it affects them as well. There's a lot of varied water temperatures on that, on that lake too right now. We sat in one spot that was 60 degrees even. <clears throat> and then we sat, and then the other day when I was That's over there. That's extremely cold. We there. had 54 now, I did catch a four pounder in the 54 degree water. And what do you think of that? When I saw this, I said, you know, I wonder. So I dug in the box, I dug out a red swim jig. And I started throwing a red swim jig, caught two fish on it. Hmm. Two fish on a red swim jig. 
But those. Why in the hell do we have a red swim jig? But because I was fishing Rayburn. Who buys a red swim jig? Because I was fishing <laughs> Rayburn the weekend before <laughs> in 55 degree water, and I was using it there, and I caught a four and a half pounder over there on a red swim jig. Red and, swim jig at Rayburn. I've used it there that? on that grass over there. Mm-hmm. Quite with good success. There's a reason. Everybody hurry up and go by red swim. No, no, no. no. But in cold water around grass, I've done extremely well with that bait, especially because I fish Rayburn for all my life. You're not sponsored by the red swim jig company. No, I'm not. Okay. But I've learned some stuff on Rayburn. Rayburn. But no, that's interesting though. But I mean, anyway, but it goes to show you that I tried that red swim jig, and today I threw a bait that I'm planning on throwing on Rayburn next weekend, and it's a little swim bait that's red. And I threw okay. it in that 62 degree water today at Welsh, and I did not get a bite on it, right? But when you get it in that cold flavor. water, <laughs> then you have a chance to get a bite on something like that. The red swim jig wouldn't work in the 62, 64 degree water at all. We had a little conversation in the boat this morning about color of baits. And, uh, you know, the general consensus, if you go ask tour pros or ask people that do it full time, man, the color just really ain't that important. It's, it's the least important decision that's on baits. Taste. But I will say this the color doesn't matter until it matters. And there's certain situations <laughs> and that's exactly that's right. There's certain, there's certain situations that. where it does matter. And I will say, we've all thrown the red rattle traps for since I was a kid, you know, fishing Rayburn, it's been a Rayburn red been a thing. Yeah. And, war, but man, know. The, you know, the red spinner bait back in the nineties was a thing out here even and we throw the red and orange cheddar bait, the fire crawl cheddar bait got hot there for a little while. And so there's something in the south in the cold water time of year where that red and orange is a, is a deal, Dave, on anything, on, on whatever bait you're throwing, that is a good color. Well, even especially on this lake also. I mean, we were throwing a red chatterbait last year, yeah. and on and, and I was going to preface back to what he said earlier, and I was telling my guys this today, that that your, your, your skill set has to be much stronger at this time of the year or even rotating up into February and March because you're going to be targeting wood, especially now, whether it be a creek, whether it be a yeah, main lake point or whatever the heck. And the guys who are really good at casting, all right, that can get that spinnerbait up there and run it and almost skin that tree going by, the more shots that you get up there right next to it, the higher your percentage of having a payday. And in these guide trips that I had last year during this time when I had them throwing this red chatterbait on that, that there was a bunch of times that this is this is a true story. He hung, he, they stuck the 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 spinner uh, the chatterbait on the stump, and then I'm easing over there and he's popping it off. He pops it off, wham, six pounder hit it as soon as he popped it off the stump. And so those stump <laughs> those fish literally are are. Nosed up to those, they're tight to the they wood. The and whether you're flipping a jig to it, throwing a spinner bait, throwing mm-hmm. a trap, the skill set of your casting ability has to be in parallel. The more casts that you miss away from it, that's going to lower your percentage possibility of how many bites you're going to get in a day. The, so the only time you, you get a, a you're little talking extra, about fire crawl when you say red, right? Yep. Okay. The only time you get a little extra freedom on being tight to the wood, to me, is on those you know real hard warming trends. When you get those real hard warming trends, they'll roam a little bit and get out away from that cover a little bit. But most of the time out here when it's cold or kind of stable or cooling, yeah, what he's saying is right. You know, we throw the jig a little bit away from the tree, but that's because we're down in the roots. You know, right. we're cranking or anything out. I told this guy, same thing this morning. We picked up crankbait for a little bit. He asked me, he's like, you know, do you try to avoid this timber when you're cranking? I'm like, no. Hang that sucker up, dude. Yep. Like, get it in there. Bang it around as much as you can. Well, there's another caveat to this, too, that he didn't mention, though, and it's timing. And at this time of the year, so we're dealing with 50 degree water right now. And if you notice that, that if you get a day like today, dead sun, I mean, it's pointing straight down, kind of focus on those northwest side of the lake, on those pockets, so even out on the main lake, but also from three o'clock till dark. All right. That's really, and if you explore that a lot, you're going to find that you will get more bites in that window than you will get any other time. I was going to ask you, how many you caught before three o'clock today? And, and was it better after, or did you stay out there it's that been, long? It's been better after all week. It's been better after all, all week. week. And after, it's almost well, always going to be I that fish, way. I usually fish from, well, I'll say that with an exception, the guaranteed tree did kick out like four or five fish. Really? Right off the bat. You've got to show me where the that money, is. The like we, pull, like, we pulled up on that sucker, the and it goes. And he, Can I it, catch an under on it? I need under no. for the tournament next month. Very rarely. <laughs> Very rarely. We No, we pulled up on there, and the guy... He, first two casts, he caught a bass. His third cast, he missed one. His fourth cast, he caught one. I seen that video. Yeah, and then and then he ended up getting a couple more that, bites I off seen there. That tree in a later. lot of videos. <laughs> yeah, that, the guaranteed tree kick, and that was, I mean, that was it. 
seven thirty a.m. So that was a unique deal, but you need to put a big flag with the money symbol. Other on than top that, of that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had a wait a minute, no, we had a situation. The only money symbol on that tree is the waypoint on my grass. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's, that's the only symbol we need on that tree. I mean, we had a situation last year in April where there's a similar money tree to that. It was later on, but we pulled up and I looked for for combination wood like this. You want something that's yeah. just not one pole timber or one. I w I'm looking for something that's got some grouping to it. And we threw, there's just one in particular one and we pulled up there to it and Zach throws up there and the very first fish he sets up immediately catch a three pounder. And uh, well, that's cool, you know. And so I throw to the right hand side of it and I'm talking to him. I look up and there goes my line going that way. And I set up on it, and when I did, that fish, he just took off, and there's there's trees all over the place, and he wrapped around the next tree, broke it off, all right? So I'm tying up. Zach That's throws why in there. That's you don't throw that line. Throw that, throw that, <laughs> throws in there again, all right? And then this time he catches an under. And I thought, well, you caught the male and the female on that deal. And so I'm still tying up, and he gets it off, and then he pitches back up there again and <clears throat> catches a four-pounder. And I was like, well, that thing, that's pretty good. So I have to take a picture of him. So I'm still tying up. Well, that dang it, if he don't throw back in there again, boop, this time, eight pounder. Mm. Wow. He made all learned, those pitches into that one cluster boy, and ended up on the last pitch, caught the eight pounder. I've learned two things out of that story. Number one, you need to use bigger line. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, you need to tie knots faster. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to say, I was about to say, I cannot, no I yeah. cannot tie a knot when somebody's yeah. catching fish. Listen, I got, I, but I, I got to own up to something. I got to own up to something here now. I have noticed for the first time in the past year, I'm getting real close to 40. Like I'm on the verge of 40. And for the first time this past year, that knot is starting to get a little blurry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just starting to get a little blurry. I'm like, wait a minute. Yeah. Wait till you get blurry. 70. Yeah. But, I mean, and also, too, yeah, that's, wait. looking forward to it. That's, yeah. why, <laughs> that's why, in a lot of cases, uh, most, especially right this year anymore. and even to a lot of these lakes, the pressure today was 30.19. Is that high or low? What is that? That is, that, that, is, that, is, that is on the 5 8 scale all right it's not it's it's higher but not unreasonable there was a we there was a, a pressure about two weeks ago highest i'd ever seen 3073 37 i, I, I out thought 3064 oh, was the highest i'd been before that i have a story about that if you'll let me tell that I would let me you know what day that was uh two weeks ago it was two weeks ago but i don't remember on that. welch this is true daggum story. I had a trip coming up with some guys, and I wanted, I went over to check something. I wanted to check what, what the uh, discharge chimp was, but the, the pressure was 3064. All right? There is some wood in the water over there. Yeah. So I fished around, didn't get no bites, no bites, no bites, no bites, no bites, no bites. And so I started flipping some grass, flipping some grass. Well, then I come up to an edge of grass that there was a, a stump in the middle of the grass. Well, I pitch over mm. next to that stump. And the next thing I know, boom. I'm like, oh, game on. Catch about a three-pounder. Okay, so fine. So I go down the line. I'm flipping grass. And there's another stump in the, in the grass. I throw up there next to that stump. Bonk. I was like, what the heck? And so I knew where there was some stumps in the water over there. So what do you think I drew out? A drop shot. Yeah. I pulled out a drop shot. I and, grabbed a jig. And at 3064, I went over there and went down these lines. I caught 27 bass off these stumps. All right? I thought, on the drop shot? On the drop shot. Flipping it next to the wood. So, okay, so that's good. So, man, the next day I'm all pumped up here and I, maybe I stuck them all. I don't know, but I was having fun. And so, no, we go in there the next day. The pressure was 30 32 the next day. We go down this line. Is that go, a big difference? We well, went three. It dropped a lot. And so, we start flipping yeah, that. Is the difference. They only caught 10 that day, all right, uh, off that wood. And I flipped every bit of wood that I even didn't flip the day before. So, a few days go by, a few days go by, I'm back over there, and I thought, yeah, I'm going to go check those stumps. The pressure was 30.92. I'm 29.92. <laughs> and I go by there. I did not get a bite on any stump at 29.92. they were moving. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. So... I think the pressure has to do with what it's been. Well, get this. If it does this or this, it's kind of like the warming trend thing. So then about five days later, I have another guy trip. We go over there. The pressure is 30.38 or something like that. I said... I just wonder. And I went to them stumps, boom, 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 started catching them on the stumps. When that pressure was high, those fish did this to the stump. When that pressure dropped, those fish went like that. They they moved away. Let's get some real education here. Help an idiot because I'm an idiot when it comes to this <laughs> stuff. Like, I'm really stupid. But I mean, no, help, help me, help me explain help, that. Help me understand here. What is, what would you say is a significant difference in pressure 
what is a general high number, what is a general low number, and what is a significant enough difference that you need to be paying attention. Perfect. The perfect bar barometer is under thirty. We had a bunch anything of days over 30? there. Anything under thirty. Mm -hmm. Oh, the days we had days over there in the last couple of weeks. I was telling my guys today, we caught. We didn't have any problem catching thirty-five to forty, and it was. 2980 2983 right. so under, under 30 the is low. days that are that are that like today was higher and i mean i don't blame it uh, 30, 19 is okay it's a little bit up there but usually what happens is the last three hours of the day it makes up even on cold fronts even on high pressure you still get bit today we did not get bit in that window which was a little bit dismaying i don't know why so, I can't, I can't, so can't explain if it. under 30 is is low is, what is what the is game? What is average? What's like the average number of pressure? Which you'll see the pressure almost all the time. 2990, 2995. I was about to say 29, So that's good. Nine, so, yeah. 29, now, what is right now. how much above 30 is does, it? 2998. Yeah. How much above 30 does it need to get for you to be like, man, this, this is going to change? This is going to affect how I attack these fish. What's the number that you started changing your tactic? 30, 20 or better. 30, 20, 20. And today, you know, I told these guys, I said, I did not check it today, but I have sensed that it was up there because of the bite. And when I was driving, as soon as we left out of that parking lot, I asked Siri, what's the pressure at my location? 30, uh, 19. Uh, I thought, mm -hmm. well, that's not like drastic, but still it shouldn't affect that bite. And I'm that. assuming that that pressure was probably pretty low on Wednesday when all, or Tuesday and Wednesday when all the rain yep. clouds were here. Yes. yes. And that's why I told these guys. So when it rains and it gets cloudy, <coughs> then that pressure's dropped a little bit and those, those fish get up on top of the grass mm -hmm. is what they do, especially on an overcast day. And it makes a big difference on what you're trying to throw at them, whether it be a, a down bait, which is a Cinco or something slow moving like a Texas rig or throwing a swim jig, throwing a, a chatter bait, throwing a, uh, you know, just a swim bait, whatever the case. And no. so it affects it. So what I do, what I do when I get into a super high pressure situation, I've learned over time is, is if I'm over there, then we're going to tackle some wood. I didn't think the pressure was high enough, high enough to do that. But also too, a lot of times I will go to lighter line and I had them throwing 12 pound line today on those Cinco's that they were throwing in the sunshine. And I don't think, we didn't get a bite, did we? We did not get a single bite on it. Not a bite. And I was like, hmm. This is one of those deals where you go like this. 12 pounds, not too bad. I can get 12 pounds. <laughs> the day I was with him here on Fork, he had, oh he, we was all three throwing different signs, thickness of the line until he decided what, what it was going to be. The Joker believes in that line. Man. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and different color, especially when you get over there at that pond uh, it's clear where water. you can see yeah. seven, eight foot in some places, uh, it makes a huge, huge, huge difference. It's. Uh, I'll tell you what it makes more of a difference. To me, for me, the line size does make a difference. It, it, the difference it makes is the action on your bait. Believe it or not. Especially if you're fishing something like what Dave was talking about with a drop shot, Cinco, light Texas rig, all that stuff. Man, you get 20 pound line on that stuff. It affects the way your bait is presented in the water, but the way your bait moves through the water column. And it takes some of the life out of your bait if you overpower the line, is about the best way I know to describe it. So I do think the line size matters. And I do throw, I throw 12 pound line. I throw 12 pound line when I'm throwing a jerk bait. I throw 12 pound line when I'm throwing weightless play, you know, wacky worm, a Cinco, stuff like that. Uh, Drop shot, I'll throw a 12 pound line on out here. So, when do you do that? When, when do you do that? Yeah, but here's the way. Here's when, the way. When, I can't, hey, when I've winded for five hours and ain't got a bite on the last say. three hours, I was we'll go say. ahead and pick up that. I was going to say. That's stick. just it. If you're in a situation, you know, yeah. if if you're under a, a, a low, lower pressure situation under 30, and then you're throwing the 20 pound line, those fish have a tendency to be more active. And so you can get away with it under that environment. But it's always good to have it because. If the bite is slow and for some reason you're not getting not getting as many bites, especially on a slower moving bait like a Cinco, a yeah. Texas rig, or something like that, and you've gone three or four hours without a bite, it ain't gonna hurt you to pick up a rod with 12 pound line on it and throw it and just to see, especially if it's fluorocarbon. I'm not a fan of fluorocarbon because mm -hmm. if you nick it, it'll break off like that. If you get any kind of nick, especially around this wood that we fish or something like that, so. Too brittle for me. Oh, it's, no, it we, is. We, we it, dangled. Listen, now, it I love, is before brittle. you say that, it is brittle. I fish fluorocarbon a lot, and my man right there in the back of the crowd dangled, and I'm talking about dangled a seven was pounder. Yeah. It was oh, hung up. The line went up, like the fish wrapped, and the line was on a knob on a stump this high, this high above the water, and that fish is like hanging. 
<laughs> yeah. on that floor carpet and the wind's blowing us away and it was there for a while before I got over to it and got it off because I had to go over and grab it. Hey, hey Billy, but, years ago, last seven pounder I caught up here was on floor carbon in 30 foot of water. He yeah. wrapped me up with a, in a tree. Yeah. We went this way, went this yeah. way, couldn't get him loose. Yeah. Got right on above it, and I said, I'm going to break him off. And that line slid up the tree. He swam off, and yeah. I got him. I just, so I'm a believer I, in fluorocarbon. I don't understand why you're saying fluorocarbon so fragile, because, dude, I fish fluorocarbon at, like, man, even. But you're when using 200-pound tests. When I try to break it, it, like, pulls my boat. I mean, no, that, no, that line I today, can tow you in with Dave, it. Dave, that line today was 17-pound <laughs> test. That was 17-pound test, Seaguar and Visit. Yeah. And he dangled a seven yeah. pounder. It was flopping, and that fish was hot and fresh. It was going crazy, jumping now, and diving and all that stuff. I will say that seventeen. I don't know that I've ever had an issue with it. Fifteen on the floor carbon. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've had issues with nicks and what. Now I will enlighten you guys on something that <clears throat> that that I learned, and I've been doing this for a lot, a lot, a lot of years. And last year, he and I shot a couple of videos on a couple of different lakes, and unbeknownst to him, I really was setting him up for a test. All right, and it was he a, thought he was going to and it was a line test, test. <laughs> and it was a line test. He thought he was going to get out there and catch a bunch more we fish than I was. Of lakes, and I wanted to see if the, if, the, if the light line was going to be more dominant for bites and for overall on these two lakes. All right. Well, as it turned out, the 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 color of the water it was pretty stained, heavily stained. You couldn't see more than that far down. All right. So the lesson I learned is that he still caught six pounders on this jig, five and six Shut pounders. And a shaky head, yeah. I yeah, mean, when we went to Pines, it was shaky head. We were both on the same bait on Pines. Yeah, and yeah. but I was using 12-pound line. And the well, problem, and the, what I what came at the end of the day was we had the same amount of bites at the end of the day, mm -hmm. throwing the exact same bait. Well, I thought on Pines you used like 7-pound line or something like that. I, I tried 7-pound for a while, and he kept I, breaking I broke off too. <laughs> he kept breaking <laughs> off. <laughs> hey, I'm over here boat flipping 6-pounders, and he's breaking off. <laughs> well, I got that 17 well, what I was line, after though. with this study was the fact to see if it made that big a difference. Really what I learned, and we went to another lake the next day, and we fished this lake, and... I was throwing the 12 pound line up there and I'd get a bite and then I'm, I'm reeling one in. He'd come off or something. And then this numbskull throws a jig right in behind me to the same spot. Bonk, six pounder. Man, I would never do something. You like did that. Oh, I I would never. You are Captain Hole Pirate. I right. would never. So, so both those lakes. Hey, listen, every time y'all see them black birds flying over the lake, <laughs> hey, that's my spot. That's my hole buzzer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What I determined from this was, and it, it gave me a different confidence level of understanding, is that when I get into more stained water, then 17-pound line is no issue at all, no matter what bait you're throwing. If you're throwing a jig, Ooh. if you're throwing a shaky head, in the off-color water. Stained water. I, stained water, I, let, heavily stained water. Let me disagree with you on one little tiny aspect. I think, especially for a dragon bait, I think you're fine. Like, if you've got a quarter ounce or three-eighths ounce or heavier shaky head, it's not going to make a difference. But if you're throwing, like, a sixteenth ounce shaky head... Oh, like, but you wouldn't yeah. be doing that. Then, right. then, no, then, you then the line size... No. And I'll tell you what else. The one bait that's kind of a power fishing bait that I've kind of started throwing a lot more the last few years, that line size makes all the difference in the bites you get... The jerk bait. Jerk bait. Uh, uh, jerk, in the way I fish jerk bait, it's pretty much a power fishing bait. Like, it's 40 whatever degree water out there today, and I'm throwing a jerk bait while they're throwing a jig, and like, it ain't pausing longer than twitch, 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 twitch. Like, that's. It. But you throw it on 12 pound line. You put it on flora? Yes, I'm throwing it on 12. Well, if 12. I want it to sink, if I want it to achieve max depth, I throw it on 10 or 12 pound flora. Yeah. At times right now, with the depth of water we're fishing, I'm actually throwing it on 12 pound monofilament. Still 12 pound line to give You're me that freedom of movement deep. to give me the right You're action, but the flotation of the monofilament keeps it a little bit higher yes. in the water column, yeah. which is what I kind of need in a lot of the areas we're fishing right now. So right now, predominantly, I'm throwing it on 12 pound mono. Um, but yeah, no, you, to me, a jerk bait. If you throw it on 15 pound line or heavier, like if you get above 12. It takes away from the action on your jerk bait, and you're going to get less bites. Yeah. I think normally I would throw I would throw a shaky head on 15 pound line most of the time. But if the water is super 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 clear, and if I can see three foot down or more, then I'm going to start tearing down maybe to 14 pound four carbon, or even to even going to 12 pound line on that. And I've had I, I we don't have enough time to tell stories on it, but I got shallow uh, clear water stories out the wazoo about how it made an incredible difference on how many bites you get in that really really gin clear water so what we need to do athens what we need welch. to do is we need to go to athens or welsh and i'll throw my swim baits and my chatter baits and my swim jigs on my 17 pound line i don't and believe you throw whatever you want to throw with no eight we'll, pound we'll, no, line no 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 what we'll do we'll go to welsh and we'll both throw cinco's 
or shaky heads or something like that, you use your 150 pound line, I'll use the, the 10 pound line, and then we'll see who gets some more bites at the end of the day. You're gonna put me on a water, on a lake with clear water and grass, like I'm throwing a swim bait, like. No, but I mean, yeah. this, we, this, uh, you're not going to throw a swim bait on 12 pound line. It don't make any difference because that's a moving bait. It's, it's, and it costs you 40, it's an ob bucks, objective you know, deal to where those fish, it's a reaction bite. I'm talking where it really counts and it shows they, up. They follow the swim bait stare at a long it time. It's not really a reaction. It shows up <laughs> extraordinarily high when you're using a drop shot. <laughs> when you are using a drop shot or well, a shaky head. Where'd You're you gonna go find to somebody Martin else Street? to do that test with, because I ain't going out there all day throwing drop shot. <laughs> right? <laughs> Aren't you going to Martin Street? I'm going to pick up a line to Creek before you went to Welsh. No, I, I, I was. Going I thought to the Martin last Creek. time I talked to you, uh, were you there for the warming trend? No, I have been. I was uh, on Martin Creek a little bit in like November, December. I, don't I, don't always one, I thought one of you guys was going like a week or two ago. Mm -hmm. Not to Martin. I haven't been to Martin. I've been Martin's good lake though. Martin is a good lake. Martin's good lake, and it's it's in. Better shape grass wise now than I've seen it since I've been really fishing it for about 10, 12 years now. I've been fishing it um, consistently. Well, I don't fish it every year, but you know, I really started fishing Martin Creek about 10 or 12 years ago. And since I've been going to it, there's more grass in it than there has to be. There's tons of grass in it. Like, I've, been, I've been fishing it. It used to kind of be like there was grass in isolated areas, but not all over the place. Man, it's, it's kind of getting to a point now where there's other than the hot, which is the weirdest thing. The hot water, up. the hot water side, no grass. The whole rest of the lake, which is way bigger than all of our other power plant lakes, the whole rest of the lake, grass all over it. Hot water side, not a blade. It is the weirdest. I don't for the life of me, I don't understand it at all. But where the water's the hottest, there's no grass growing. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. But I, I don't know. Maybe they got. Did tilapia eat grass? No, they don't, do they? I don't think so. Because I know on Martin Creek, there's a crap load of tilapia that hang out right around that hot water. So that hot, that discharge area, there's a bunch of tilapia that hang out over there. But I don't think they eat grass. You might know. I don't think they you, do. You know this, Billy? Um, Maybe not when I got when I was first Maybe first going to Martin Creek, the first time I ever got Maybe. me Martin Creek last. Well, it's got like current, uh, they Lake Matt. and it had this little like notation um, about a game warden. That had found a 29 inch bass on dead on the shore That's a that had a five pound. It was a game warden. It was a picture. It isn't real. Um, well, I mean, if it wasn't a game warden, no one believe it. But it supposedly had a five pound bass in his. Man, pack. I know a game warden. He tailors my buddy. They just as full of it as the rest of it. <laughs> I, I love them. I love them. They do great work for our state. But they they just dudes like the rest of it. My uncle, my uncle was a head game warden in Cata Parish over in Louisiana for mm. twenty five years. So uh, those are really full he, of it. He could. He could them really Louisiana tell get away. Too. Hey, <laughs> them Louisiana game wardens ain't doing their job because them dudes in Louisiana. Kill everything. That, that, that's everything. because that's because my uncle retired twenty years there ago. They weren't, do, they weren't doing that. Ju they weren't doing that junk when, when Uncle Curtis was out there. Man. Man. They weren't getting by he, Uncle he Curtis. He was arresting everybody for every damn thing there was. Uncle Curtis, that's yep. a, hey, oh Uncle Curtis, the GW. You wasn't hey, Uncle Curtis in the green jeans will write you up now. I like it. Back to this lake. It, I think that if you're if you're looking to, to have a shot at a big fish, I mean. It's either got to be on a creek. I've this is the way I do it. I fish the creeks early, and then you can go to those points like like he's talking about late after three o'clock. You could throw a big spinner bait, you could throw a chatter bait uh, or a jerk bait on those places, and I you know I mean that combination, you got a good chance to catch yeah. a good one right now. Does Does anybody have any questions about how to fish some of these structures we talked about earlier? No? I'm a little curious about the drop shot, and, and I don't want to go into like secretive stuff, but. Uh, what do you what do y'all uh what weight and what 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 do you throw on a drop shot? Well, it depends. I've got I don't throw one. I've got at quarters. I've got three eighths and I've got halves. But I use probably three eighths predominantly. Depending on the wind. But not necessarily. Not really. Not necessarily. Okay. If right. it's super super windy and I'm fishing deep, I'll use a half. But yeah. most of the time, it's still going to be a three eighths no matter what. But is a drop shot something you throw a lot this time of year? Absolutely, one hundred percent. Yeah. And here's why. Here's why. Because I used to fish all the tournaments here, the, the stringer mm. tournaments, mm. all right? And a drop shot is the money tactic yeah. in order to catch those big unders, all right? And we and I actually, on the same thing, I caught, I was telling my guys today, I caught an 1161 uh, on it on 12-pound line, and we won that tournament handily. But that thing is more efficient. Now, we was talking about it today is that I use bait casting rods 
uh, I use uh, instead of spinning rods. And the number one reason why is, is the accuracy that you can flip with it or cast it or horse stuff out of uh, junk versus a spinning rod uh, mm. where you have less leverage in that yeah. capacity. So if you if you decide I'm going to run out and tie one on and, and go fish it, well, you're going to end up after about an hour, you're going to find out that all of a sudden the line starts wrapping around the tip of your rod when you do that. And a lot of times, depending on what weights you use, the baits want a helicopter going down. Mm -hmm. So I had to put, many years ago, I buy these 35-pound Spro swivels. They're the smallest swivel you can get. And I tie the 12-pound main, and then I'll use on the fluorocarbon, uh, depending on how clear the water is or what, what the application. And then I'll go from the swivel down to the hook, down to the weight. And then uh, most of the time using 12, but a lot of times I'll use 8 uh, with that going down, depending on the application. Mm -hmm. And it works. It's, it's pretty bulletproof. I've learned over time that teardrop weights, are, they fall better than the cylindrical. Cylindricals are the ones that really do this going down. Hmm. Round ones will hang up on everything known to yeah. man yeah. on this lake. If you have a, red, a round drop shot weight on, you're going to lose it. So, so Robo Worm, Dream Shots, Half Shell, Smally Smashers? Well, I, I use uh, the, one of the main, I use a lot, I have a lot of Robo Worms, uh, but I use have mainly you? the KVDs, the, uh, the their, their, no, the finesse, no. their finesse worms, and the, mm. I like the five inch fat ones. They make a five inch that's a regular and a five inch fat. Of course, everything I haven't bought, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and they're coffee. Wait a minute, wait a minute. It's gonna go. I'm gonna I, mean, go one I got step. like five drop shot bags. In my, I'm gonna go one I mean, step further with that. And the reason rabbit, why yeah. too is I learned quite a few years ago that most people don't pay attention to the scent, but mm, I'll tell you what, I learned a hard lesson on that. The scent uh, that on the when you put on these baits, it accounts for about three times more bites than what you're gonna get on a regular that's worm. Uh, it's a lot. That made me think of something I never thought I was going to, uh, I never thought I'd ask, but, uh, and I don't want to, if it's inappropriate because of the guy's company or whatever, the the stuff with the salt. We ain't got and, no brand loyalties around here. Far away, dog. Okay, you know you know what they're selling at all the shops now, the, the juice, which you put in the salt, you put it in your bag. I you truly look, believe it's. Oh, real time. Yeah, is, that, is that stuff any good? Real time Rod's got it. I don't know. And I, I, matter of fact, the guy that just called me a second ago, he, he's actually taken some of it and put it in some of my bags. Where the hell do you see that from there? I can see really well. I can see a fly's. A gnat's butt at 100 yards. This dude's like 85 years old. He still sees his knots. Mine are getting I don't have... I can tie knots, so I have no problem. What's up with that? I got no problem. Well, anyway, some of us are just old. Is that, is that sauce for real or what? That sauce is for real. Yes, okay. it is. And you don't have to put but a few drops in there and then rub it around the bag like that. And I used to buy used these worms. Uh, and I learned this lesson many years ago when Talon, this company that uh, I'm actually on their staff, and they had a uh, bass appeal in a certain uh, drop shot worm that I use. And... When they quit, they actually had to get out of the business of doing that. And I, all the bags I had left, I'd buy trick worms and put in the bag and rub it around with all the bags I had left. So I would try to triple my volume with it. And there was tournaments where I used to fish with this guy. And when we fished all the stringer tournaments here, and I did the same test. And that's how I came up with three to one. I never told him that I was using a scented worm versus a non-scented worm. And yeah. it is it is has a value. I, I love I love it because I'm a culprit when I when mm -hmm. I throw a ribbon tail I throw a culprit and you know they have no scent yeah. I like the sheen I like the sheen on it but uh, now that y'all said that stuff is you I'll know, tell you, legitimate on a slow moving uh, which is a good thing because I spent about four hundred dollars on bottles of that crap and oh. it's in every plastic bag <laughs> a real I have. S simple one to use that I've used for scent was in in years past and it's just super easy one to spray when you just Hold your line up, spray your bait, you know. But uh, I don't like that because the wind blows it back to the motor, blows it under your grass well, screen. You got to be aware. Yeah, you come out Hold smelling on. like Dave, garlic. You, you didn't know. You just need a little situational awareness. You just turn this way. And I, understand you know, that. Yeah, it's, I understand it's, that. It's like wind peeing, man. You the wind. Uh, don't wind, can, wind can change in a second, Billy. Yeah. <laughs> Dave, you, you, now let me ask you, right Dave. Back in your face. If, if the wind's blowing up from the back side of your boat, do you go to the back of your boat to take a leap? No, I just hold it back here and spray it. So I do want to. So one thing about the drop shot deal that relates to everything we talked about tonight on structure is I don't fish a drop shot at all this time of year, partly because I'm just hard headed. And I want to throw the jig, you know. Uh, but I will say that I had a great conversation with Justin Lucas here recently about their deal that was here last year in February during the same pattern, and when everybody in the beginning of the tournament was throwing a jig and he was too, but he just for whatever reason wasn't getting a whole lot of bites on it. 
he picked up a drop shot and fished the same exact jig pattern that we've talked about at nauseum since December here lately. He did the same exact pattern with a drop shot and got a top 10 finish in that event doing it. So the same deal on the creek channel edges and the root systems with a drop shot can also be effective. It'd make me so scared to do that, to throw a drop shot in there with that smaller hook and smaller line and all that. Like I'd feel like I was going to lose every fish if I did that. But, <laughs> but I mean, that is a very effective, you know, thing that, that to be honest with you, everybody's so caught up on throwing a jig and this time of year out here, those fish probably aren't seeing a whole lot of drop shots in that same place that we're throwing a jig. You're not locked in to using that light line, mind yeah. you. And during like April last year, I was using an eight to 17 line rated rod with 15 pound line on it and with 15 pound fluorocarbon on it. And because we were fishing around wood and we caught plenty of seven, eights, nines. Mm. I think a lot what? of that has to do with confidence. Yeah, yeah, that's something so I don't feel good about. Oh, confidence is number one. You know, when I'm throwing a jig, every time it hits a root, I'm like, uh, it's coming. There he's going to hit it. And that's how I feel. And so that causes me, what confidence in fishing does is it causes you to fish the bait in a manner that's more likely to get bit. You know, if you don't have confidence in the bait and I'm dragging that drop shot through there and I'm not liking it and I'm not feeling good about it, then I'm probably going to fish that drop shot too fast through there, too slow through there. I'm not going to present the bait in a way where I'm all in mentally and I'm ready to catch one. And then when I do get a bite, I'm prone to screw it up because I'm not locked in. Whereas with that jig in my hand, for me, I'm confident in it. So every time I bump a root system, I'm anticipating a bite. But you gotta and I don't miss them because of that. you got to consider the source of these two people sitting right yeah, here. Yeah, totally different. He is a big fish animal, all right? Mm -hmm. he, and, and he asked me a question one day uh, on a stage. He says, uh, I mean, how many zeros you had I mean, in, in guiding? And I said, I had to think about it. None. You know, as far as he, and he looks at me like I, and he, I'm lying. He says I'm, I'm lying, and I, said, I still think you're lying. No, I'm not lying. <laughs> in the fact, zero, in the fact yeah. that when Sorry, you throw um, lighter line drop shots, lighter baits, yeah. <laughs> when we go out, I'll fish the same structure he's fishing. We get more bites. Now we don't necessarily catch all those eights, There's tens, like fish, he's going yeah. with the he's, big he's with the big jig, red, uh, but. He swings for the fence. <laughs> I'm trying to get more numbers for my guys. And if yeah. we happen to snap onto a big fish, praise the Lord. That's a just the way ask it works. How many, right? Ask how many zeros I have on guy trips. How many I got zeros you have on guy trips? You can't count them. Plenty. <laughs> you can't count them. Plenty. I went Plenty. out with them both. <laughs> you have fun with them both. <laughs> but, but we that's can true. get them. You are going to have fun. That, is, that part is but, like the guarantee. That's even more guaranteed than the guaranteed tree. You're going to have a good time when we go. That's and right. neither but, one of us. But when you do get a bite. It's a bite. It's a bite. Oh, there'd be no usually, doubt about it. Usually the average size and fish I mean, we're catching my boat's pretty Between the two of us, it ain't never going to be a slack minute. We're going to work to the end level well, yeah, in true. order to try to make it happen to our best little or our ability. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, you know, I mean, okay. We, uh, I know that I went to every level I could go in order to try to, to turn it into something. I'm right. a little bit of a victim of my own circumstances here with what I do as far as the, as far as the style I fish. Because here's the deal. Davis fished a lot more tournaments than I have. Before I started guiding... You know, I made a decent living, but, you know, I had a mortgage and two kids and family, and you know, I just didn't have the money to go fish higher entry fee tournaments. I mean, the majority, the vast majority of tournaments that I fished before I was guiding were some open club deal, you know, you 70 to $100 entry fee, and once in a while, <laughs> I'd splurge on a big bass event or something like that and pay 150 or $200 for that, but... You know, I just I wasn't going and fishing Bass Champs at three hundred dollars a team, and I wasn't going and fishing Texas Team Trail, and you know I wasn't doing well, Texas Team Trail didn't exist back then, but I wasn't doing any of that type of stuff. Thanks, you wasn't even thinking about going to the Costas or whatever BFLs or any of that. You know, I just wasn't financially on that level where I felt like I could do that. Because the reality is, when you go fish at that level, you know you're probably going to lose some money. You know, even even when you win with all the if you're going to go do it, that's the other thing about me, too. If I was going to do that level of tournament, I was going to be all in on it. And I dang sure, I could probably scrape by the entry fee, but I couldn't afford the travel and the days off work. And I just didn't have the means to do that. So my history is I don't really fish very many meaningful tournaments, right? And then I start guiding out here because another guide that is a high-level guide out here suggests that I should whenever me and him fish the tournament together. He kind of talks me into starting to guide part-time. So then I go from not really fishing any tournaments to guiding. And my style of fishing on this lake, since I didn't really fish, and I hated the stringer tournaments out here where you catch five-pounders and you beat by two-pounders. Right. Hated that. <laughs> so I didn't do any of those. 
So my there's, experience there's an art farm to it. Yeah, I know there is. No, there's. I give y'all you guys credit. I just I don't like it. But my experience fishing this lake was we're trying to catch the five biggest fish we can. Even when I wasn't fishing tournaments, my tournament was when I go out on Saturday, I'm trying to catch the biggest five fish I can because that's how you measure. For my whole lifetime watching Bassmasters or whatever else, right. the way you measure your success is what is your best five way, right? Yeah. So that's how I've always so thought of it. Sack. And now I've gotten no to a point where I do it for a living full time for several years now, and I've never had a weigh-in to go to. So when I go out and we don't catch them, there's no negative repercussions other than, you know, we didn't catch them. There's no, like, monetary negative repercussions. So it has turned me into this guy that is willing to not catch them to do what I think gives me the best chance to put my people on the biggest five fish they can catch. And that's what we're doing. And some days... We don't catch five. We didn't catch five. We fished a half day this morning. We didn't catch five. Yeah, but the reason, the, the nice thing about pork is, is there's a place for both of you. Oh, yeah. Like on the situation. That's and what I told him. The reason him. I went out with David Ozio is because I wanted to go out and target them, under, yeah. locate them. Yeah. I went out with Billy to see where the, where he was focusing on them big ones. Both play into effect. And Mike, mm -hmm. Mike end up in the tournament, stay on all on David's spots. Yeah. I don't know what the day is. I might hit Billy spots first. So yeah, because of how Lake Fork plays out and how the tournaments are on it, there's a good place for yeah. both of you. Well, and what was that? Was that two years ago that we went out? It was. It was like January two years ago, right? Yeah. And every pattern that I just talked about tonight, that's all we did. Yeah. And we only did I think two of them that day because it'd be culture. So I think we fished shallow points and we fished creek channels. Yeah. And that's so guys. These patterns that we're talking about, and I only point that out to say this: these patterns we're talking about, this ain't like it's working right now. This ain't like it's you know working this week. These are patterns that are the one thing that I maybe like the most about winter fishing, other than the fact that there ain't very many people on the water. I love that. Uh, these patterns that occur in the winter time out here are the most consistent thing you could ever imagine. It is every single year that I've ever fished this lake. It's those four patterns are the same. Once you get past Christmas, those four patterns take over, and that's it for three months, dude. Go get it. You ain't got to have very many rods on your deck. You ain't, you're eliminating 90% of the water. And go do those four patterns, and you got it. It's one of those four. Yeah. The weird thing, too, about uh, catching these unders here, this month right now, you can catch them in 25 to 35 foot. <laughs> I've got four locations. I've heard that. that I've I can, heard it from you that and I some other catch guys. Them, yeah. and I've won 20 tournaments here during January over the last 12 years doing that in that depth of water. And they're there. But when it gets to the first week of February, those things are gone. Hmm. They're gone. Because the Bass Champs Tournament that's coming up here at February the 25th, yep. those fish will not be on any of those locations in that 22 to 35 foot. They will not be there. And I, I find that just, and it's happened every single year. It's so weird. But in the end of January, end of December, all of January, they will be on those spots. And I mean, it's just something you learn over time. It's just uh, crazy. No matter what the water level is either. Aren't they just moving in in front of the females to, do, to get the? But we're room? talking, we're talking extremely Mom. small fish that I don't even know spawn. Oh, yeah. Remember, yeah, like little rem bass. Remember, even those little male bass are going to spawn. There's a whole bunch of them that ain't spawning until May. Yeah, yeah. in April, late but, April, and those fish that ain't spawning until late April or May, like. They're not doing anything right now. They're just winter. Uh, they're they're yeah. winter fish is all they are. <laughs> and what's even more weird about that is, is that I no year that I can ever remember that in those locations that you catch a fish over three and a half pounds, which is even more weird. Uh, the question for, I got for January is, now that you guys have both been fishing this low lake for a year, mm -hmm. and it's slowly come up to what is it five five and a half? Yeah, it's less than a foot it change over the last year. Seven, right it was at five seven one, Do you and think then the went grass back down. The banks is gonna stay. Yeah, I saw a video. You found some grass. What was no, it? I wasn't a video. It was just a picture. A picture. What? Did, uh, you found some grass? Where? You found grass in the water. <laughs> in the water. In the water. <laughs> so he knows my answer. In the water. It's and it's it's nothing to get excited about. It ain't nothing to go seek. At. Don't waste your time looking for it. It's not enough to fish. It will be when the lake comes out. Though. Well, well, no, it will be if it keeps growing. Well, you know, there's all different circumstances, Avery, on that deal. Um, if the water level stays relatively close to what we have now, then yeah, that grass will continue to expand and grow as the water heats up. There's no doubt about it. It sure will. Um, but if the lake all of a sudden jumps up this spring, and now those little sprigs of grass that are growing are now all of a sudden in 
<laughs> six foot of water, no, they're probably going to die. Ah. They're probably going to get blown out and probably die more. But here's the good news. When all that stuff, when all that dry lake bed fills back, this is what's going to happen. You can write this down right now. Go ahead and write it down. This is what will happen. You have to be patient, but this is what's going to happen. When the lake finally fills all the way up and all of that flooded stuff dies, all that flooded stuff is going to die within week, months, if not weeks, of the lake filling up. All that flooded stuff will die and it will create a slime and it'll be nasty up shallow for a little while. You can't paint anything about the fish up there. Then that's all going to go away. Sometime within that next calendar year, that first five feet of the water column is going to be chock full of grass from one end of the lake to the other. That's going to happen. Now, if we can get that grass to establish itself and get a good growing year and have it expand and get into six, eight, nine foot of water, now we'll be set up for long-term success where that grass will hold up year after year. If that grass stays in five foot of water or less, most of it will die in the winter. Some areas will hold on to it, but most, most of the grass will die throughout the lake if it doesn't grow out to at least six to eight foot. That's, That's just how it ask. works. You talk to a lot of people that around this lake all the time and have the knowledge on it. I wanted to know what you're being here. Yeah, so that, that that grass that's just starting to grow, it's not anything to fish. It's, and I was, it's two or three strands here, two or three strands over there, uh-huh. two or three strands 50 yards that way. Like it's just every once in a while you'll catch a piece of it on your chatterbait. And it's not anything that you can really feel with you a trap or a chatterbait it's not anything that's really holding fish but it is good to see that grass starting to grow and it tells me that even if the lake does not come up this year which is let's be honest it's texas we're not the wettest place on earth all the time like the next seven days look awful wet it, it, yes. it is it is a possibility though it is a possibility that we don't get more than a foot or two change in elevation throughout the year that is very much the lake fork standard is because we don't have a river you know, we're just dealing with runoff in this lake. There is no river going through Lake Fork. Have they closed so, the dam? Yeah, it's been, it's been closed for a year. Yeah. They ain't opened really? it all year. No, they haven't it's, opened it. They haven't high. opened it since they dropped it. <clears throat> they pulled water out November and December, though. Through yeah, the water see, park. That, 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 mm-hmm. that's water what park. I, I, I Yeah, the no, trainer. They, it was they usually getting... always do that in the fall. For whatever reason, on, on the Dallas oh, rotation, water, yeah. we get pulled... Water, water gets pulled to Dallas from here in the fall every Some year. Some engineering stuff or something. But the normal thing on Lake Fork is to have less than a foot fluctuation up or down. Oh, That's yeah. normal year. Oh, yeah. So if that is the case this year and we don't come up, then that grass that's starting to grow by the time we get to the fall should be in pretty good shape. Mm-hmm. And we should be able to have good fall grass to fish and then set up hopefully for next spring. And then at some point if the water comes, that's kind of what I hope happens is that this lake stays from four to six foot low for another two years, lets that grass get really good and established right now. And what is right now, zero to three or four foot of water. And then the lake comes up four or five foot. Now you've got grass in what? 20 foot of water. Yeah, well, you well, not, not, 20, not immediately. Six, eight foot. But six, you've eight, got it in that eight, eight, ten, eight yeah. nine, seven foot of water. If you've got healthy, thick grass in eight or nine, 10 foot of water, seven foot of water, that grass will stay year round, year after year, and we could be set up good long term. And then we'll get the shallow growth on top of it. That would be the best case scenario to me yeah. is if we stay low for a couple more years, get that grass growth in what, what is now shallow, have it come over that, and then get new grass growth up shallow. Now you've got a situation where you could see a very significant change in something that Lake Fork hasn't had since. 2008, 2009, 12, 2010. 15 years ago. Well, yeah, I mean, 11 was the last time. 11, when we got in that drought, yeah. it killed all the grass. And that's, a, you know, before that's the last time we had grass like what I'm talking about. Ooh. So, and it was Why wouldn't they try and do that themselves? There's no way to do it. No. Yeah. To maintain it. To maintain the level? Yep. And give it that time. Because this is not a fishing resource. This is a water resource. I know it is. but This is a water resource. So if, they're, if they get water, they're going to hold That's on to it. That's an argument you can't win. This water right. is a commodity. Yeah. To Didn't them. they spray so, all the grass out? No, there's no, no truth to that at all. They sprayed the hyacinth. There's no truth to them spraying the grass out. I, I know that that's a rumor that gets talked about. The the And they claim <laughs> it's it It's so funny. When I, when I posted... But, well, it hurt it in little areas, but it didn't hurt the overall grass in the lake. Mm-hmm. It didn't yeah. do anything to the overall grass habitat of the lake. When I posted that one picture of one little piece of grass, literally half the comments were, Texas Parks and Wildlife on their way to spray it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Those people are so dumb, man. Like, they've never spoken to a biologist at Texas Parks and Wildlife. They've never had that conversation with them. That's I've been in the boat with them when they're surveying what to spray and what not to spray on Lake Fort. When we had... 
water hyacinth issues out here and salvania issues out here. I've been in their boat with them while they're surveying it. And I'm going to tell you right now, I firmly believe, has there been mistakes made in the past of overspraying? Yeah. But it, it all, for the last 10 years, the only thing they've done for the last 10 years as far as spraying goes is they have contracted people to spray water hyacinth and giant salvinia. That's it. Now, they were using outside contractors, and one of those that they contracted one year, just, I don't know if he's getting paid by the gallon, but he went <laughs> He rogue. sprayed willow trees. And he's been... He he's, was killing willow trees, He's been too. blacklisted. He'll never get hired by Texas Parks and Wildlife again. He's been blacklisted. And now they've gotten to where they actually have their own employees within the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department that are doing the spraying. They've trained them up. They've got the equipment. They're doing the spraying. And I can tell you how they do it. They literally... If they can, if, if it's just a little, like they go back in these backwaters, and if they see a patch of hyacinth like this, they pick it up, put it in the floor boat, and crush it. They don't even spray it off. Now, if it's a patch the size of this room, they're going to go in there and spray that patch. But they're going to get on top of it with a gun and spray it. There's no more of this shooting it from here to the door and getting everything in between there with mist. And, you know, that was one thing they did do that when they first started using their own employees that were, you know, lower on the totem pole employees to come out and spray. I reported the hell out of it to them because they had guys out here in Texas Parks and Wildlife but marked boats. And what we had was we had bank grass, potato grass, alligator weed, whatever, and it would be a patch of hyacinth, 10 more yards, a patch of hyacinth. And I looked at them, and they'd pull up beside the hyacinth, and they'd go, shh, okay, that's good. And then they go, shh, and they sprayed everything between here and there. Just instead of taking the time to go up to that patch, they would just spray it and then, you know, just hit it as they went. And they, they killed... It was the very far north end of Little Canyon. They nuked it. From one week to the next, it was green grass lining every inch of bank up there and coontail and hydrilla all out in the middle. And the next week, it's all gone. Because when you spray that much chemicals in water, it's going to drift down in the water and get that other stuff too. But when you go in and isolate spot spray, it will kill some of the hydrilla and coontail in that immediate area. But it's not going to eliminate a creek arm. It's not going to eliminate a big section of the good grass. So... Is Texas Parks and Wildlife spraying all the grass to kill it? Absolutely not. They're doing everything they can. And I will tell you, my thought process used to be, man, let the water hyacinth alone. Like, hell and fish get under that too. Why are we spraying it? Think about it like this. And this is what they've explained to me, and it makes a lot of sense to me when, when I think about it. If you've got a little bit of hyacinth, that's fine. That's good. But if you get a lot of hyacinth, I mean, there was one time on this lake where half of Birch Creek was blocked off. I'm talking about solid. Hyacinth all across, all the way to the back of it, half of the whole creek. On. If you know what Birch Creek is, that's as big as some lakes. Half the, so half of that was completely covered with water hyacinth. That's obviously an issue. And if you allow that to go unchecked and you don't have really cold winters, you, like with this winter, if we had hyacinth on this lake, it'd be going, like this next year, it would be a problem because it wouldn't die this winter because the water's not getting cold enough. So now we can let this little patch of hyacinth grow till it's, you know, because it's not really a problem when it's just a little patch here, a little patch there. So we can go ahead and let that grow. But then when it becomes a problem, I've got to come in here and dump 5,000 gallons of chemicals in the lake and nuke an area. Or I can go, and I'm done. And I don't hurt the fishery. Which one would you rather them do? Go twice a year or nuke an entire creek arm <laughs> once every couple of years? Which one do you want? Yeah, the spot. I want the spot spray so we never have that nuking scenario. I don't ever want that to happen because that kills fish, that kills grass, that kills habitat, creates mad, you know, big, huge silt issues on the bottom. All kinds of issues come from having a nuking area, but you have to do it when it gets out of hand. So, no, let's go ahead and spot spray. As much as I like punching highs, with, and it hurts my soul to not have any of it to punch, <laughs> right? Because I do, and I, I killed them when we had some highs on the slate. Let's go ahead and maintain the fishery year after year. And that's what they're doing. And they are. They're doing the research, and they've got a lot more knowledge of it than any of us. That's for oh, sure. sure. And yeah. they're putting every effort they can to make sure that these fisheries are as good as they can be. Here's the deal. Yeah. Every one of them guys up there I met, they're everybody's crazy about catching a bass. Is anybody in this room? And that's what makes me feel the best about them. Is I've talked and gotten to know those guys. Every one of them is just as eat up with it as we are. They want the fisheries to fish good. They do. Not just because it's their job or it gives them less... Emails and phone call, 
they want the fishery fish good because they want to go out and catch them too. Well, most of them guys are hunters and fishermen. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be doing that job. Every one of them is. Yeah. Every one of them, and every one of them that works in the fisheries department is a bass fishing fool. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of why I brought this yep. up because I knew you had talked to several. Yep. I've seen several of your videos yep. out with them doing the, the checking on the, the throwing of worms at them, tagged yep. and all that, you know. So I Learned a lot about fish time. movements through those guys in that right. study with Jake. Uh, and Jake Norman is our, is our biologist that, that oversees Lake Fork and the area lakes and Man, he is a, uh, he is, he, we have got a real asset in Jake Norman. We need to, hopefully he stays on the state's abolishment in this area for a long, long time because he is doing a fine, fine job. In fact, I was down at Lake Fairfield. Y'all probably saw, I put a video out. Some of y'all that watch all the videos saw the video from Lake Fairfield. Well, when I was down there, I saw the biggest patch of giant salvania that I've seen since before they sprayed Toledo, when I was on Toledo before they sprayed it. And it was a good section. It wasn't anything out of control yet, but it was... It was a good cast or two link section all the way across the back of a pocket that was all solid giant salvinia. And I told him that, and I mean, you'd have thought I just told that guy's dog died. Like, I'm serious now, because Jake's over Lake Fairfield. And when I told him, the reaction was, oh, my God. You know, like, it hurt it. Like, it hurt his heart, y'all. Like, they cared deeply about these fisheries. And they are on board with the fact that hydrilla is habitat and coontail is habitat, and we need, you know, as much of it as we can, unless it's a small lake. And it, you know, sometimes that can be a problem on a small lake. But even at that, that point, they are taking steps to maintain it and manage it in a way that doesn't eliminate it. So they're doing everything right. They really are. They're doing everything you can do. So. Are you thinking it's going to be a grass lake again, like it used to be once it comes up? Man, well, there's no way to know that. You know, uh, it will I was be. Just to guess. It will be for a short time. It'll be a shallow, not like it used to be. I mean, it used to have grass at 20 foot of water. Oh, man. I think those days are done, guys. We just don't have the fertility in the lake that we used to, and that happens to every lake as it gets older. Rayburn doesn't have the grass up to 20 foot like it used to when I was a kid. You know, none of them do over <clears> a certain <throat> amount of time. But I think that after it being low like this, when it comes back up, at least for some period of time. You will have shallow grass pretty much from one of this lake to the other. Yeah, I used to launch out in coffee like 90, 91, 92. It's got to be um, all the way full to launch and, that ramp. And, I know that. And once, once you got at the end of the boat road or whatever, you were lifting up your trolling motor and barely under the, you yeah. know, cutting through grass oh, yeah. for yeah. 30 minutes I before you get, ramp, 30 minutes and before you could get down to the main lake. Yeah, for just, a while that ramp got in disrepair where you couldn't even launch a big boat off the night. That was can. back in the yeah. real yeah. good the day. And I was I, there. I mean, <laughs> all the way up into the late 90s even. I mean, it was... All you crazy. needed was a slugger. Yeah. Flip, yeah. Shoot, man. <laughs> I forget like that. I want to well, remind well, you guys punching of something. Punching the grass. As we're talking about this slow water and grass deal, I want to remind y'all of something. So in 2011, it got to the all-time low. Even lower than it got this last year, it got to seven and three-quarters foot low. Some people tell you at some point this lake got 10 or 11 foot low. That's never happened. This lake... Since it reached full pull in 80 or 82 or 83, whatever it was, the lowest it's ever been has been seven and three quarters foot low in 2011. Now, from there until 2014, 15, we kind of had, you know, it came up a little bit, but not a lot. You know, in 2012, it was like six foot low. And in 2013, it was like four to five foot low, right? So in 2012 and 13, what we had was we had grass get established, you know, after the lake had been low for a year like it has now. So it's the same thing we're going into again. We had grass get established, but it was all very shallow. Very shallow, okay? I'll take it. Right. It was all shallow. <laughs> right. But, it, but then it came up to four foot low, and that grass started expanding. We started having grass from the <clears> bank <throat> out to six to eight foot of water, yeah. and that was phenomenal. I mean, that was... You could go up, well, you're talking about Coffee Creek. Yeah. So when you're going up towards Coffee Creek, before Running Creek and Coffee Creek split, that bank on the right, there was grass out to like nine, ten foot of water on both sides of the creek channel. <laughs> All, to, I mean, it, it was to cover from side to side. But I'm talking about hundreds of acres of high drilling. Hundreds of acres of high drill on either side of the boat lane, right up in there, before you ever even got to running in coffee. And that was as recently as 2013, maybe even 14. The one problem we had is in, it was either 14 or 15, one of those years, it just, I'm talking about toad stranglers, flooded, and it got over full pull, and we had a whole bunch of and current come through the, the lake, out. and it literally ripped grass out of the lake and yeah. washed it away. 
and that killed our deep grass. And then we went back to only having shallow grass again once it reestablished. Once the lake got full and the new grass, the new the lake that had been dry started growing grass, we just had the shallow grass. And that shallow grass is what we had from that point until last year when they dropped the lake. That's what we had. So if we what we've all got to hope for here is keep staying low till we establish grass at this depth and let's go up a little bit at a time. Now, if we do that, we've got a chance. But if it rises all at once, everybody's going to get excited and be like, look at all this stuff to flip. And I'm going to be crying, going, look at all that grass that just went away. Like, it's, you know, it's going to be fun for a little while while you flip that new growth. But that new growth is going to be gone in a month. Yeah. So, I, I see you running a little bit long. I'm, I'm uh, far-sided uh, or near-sided, not far-sided. I can't tie a knot in. Uh, yeah, I can't mind. tie a knot But I just had one question. Color on the drop shot. Is what color? Oh, color on the drop shot. Red. On what you use? Red, red. <laughs> well, red. Red. that's that's yeah. dictated. That's dictated on the color of water. MM3. If you're if you're in dark water, dark uh, say stained water, you're gonna use darker baits like uh, black and blue or June bug or uh, like, like now, the bluegill ones uh, or if bluegill are those colors.